The Beaver Area Heritage Foundation wishes to thank this year's members, volunteers, and corporate sponsors. Heritage Valley Health System, Spanos Group of Raymond James, UPMC Health Plan, and Pacer Studios. Senator Matthew Quay of Beaver was a highly influential politician, locally and nationally, in the late 1890s. Born in 1833, he became a newspaper publisher and eventually served in the Union Army in the Civil War, earning a Medal of Honor. Beginning his political career as county prothonotary, he rose to state treasurer, then senator, eventually capping his career as chairman of the Republican National Committee, earning the nickname Kingmaker for engineering the elections of Presidents Benjamin Harrison and Theodore Roosevelt. Today, when our country's political discourse has never been at a higher pitch, the Beaver Area Heritage Foundation created this documentary to explore Quay's legacy. Was he a saint? Was he a sinner? We asked his biographer, 100-year-old Dr. James Keel. This is Jim Keel. Uh, I authored the book uh, Gilded Age. I had a wonderful job going through the materials that the family had to put together this work that I hope you will find interesting. Well, he got his start in Beaver. He became prothonotary. That was done pretty much as a favor to his father. The politicians wrote to the governor and said that Reverend Quay had a son who was a bright young guy with an interest in politics and asked uh, if he could be appointed prothonotary. He was never really strong in Pittsburgh. His relationship to the two main cities is as interesting as anything. Philadelphia disliked him as a result of his time there, but he had to keep his strength there. They weren't going to sell Philadelphia off to the Democrats. That was impossible. Because he always kept a power in Philadelphia. He may not win, but you were always strong. Pittsburgh, the same thing. One of the things you could do in Pittsburgh, keep the factions fighting each other. Philadelphia, the same thing. And if you can't keep the factions fighting each other, keep Pittsburgh fighting Philadelphia. And he did all of that. His strength was rural Pennsylvania all the way. When he came back from Philadelphia, he said, I've made my last move short of the grave. He was not the most handsome looking man. One eye drooped, he was short. But he was pleasant with people, apparently. He always saw to it that your glass was full. But generally, he put off seeing people. The key to his life is silence. Anything that dealt with politics was silence. In other words, to use one of the quotes, he said, never write anything if you can say it. Never say it if you can nod your head. And he uh, conducted his business with politicians that way. He wanted candidates who didn't talk. He, he had the uh, attitude, never confirm what people say about you. Never deny what they say about you. If it's good or bad, silence w was the key to his dealing with people. The politicians who talked up didn't get very far. I say there were three sources of power. One was organization. One was a strong voter base. 
And the third one was money. He was a poor man when he started into the business, but he didn't remain poor very long. These are going to be three of the keys to un understanding a character of Quay in politics. After the Civil War, he became a member of the uh, Simon Cameron machine. Cameron was the most prominent Republican in Pennsylvania. Cameron was aging. He wanted to pass the business on to his son. In fact, he very cleverly had his son succeed him as senator, but he made J. Donald Cameron his replacement in the United States Senate. But at the same time, he realized that Donald wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he found a young man in Matt Quay who was organizationally sharp, and he had turned much of the organization work over to Quay. And before long, instead of being the Cameron organization, it became the Quay organization, which didn't uh, disturb Cameron at all because Quay was doing what the father had done, only he was doing it better. He found a way to get money. As Quay looked at the political scene, the secretaries of the treasury who had preceded him had gone into the job poor, but came out rich. Then he became secretary of the treasury and he discovered how it was done. The government of Pennsylvania had to deposit its money somewhere in private banks, and they selected banks to do it. The banks were spread over the state, but any bank that got state deposits got a bonanza, more so than you realize, because the government of Pennsylvania didn't exact any interest. As Secretary of the Treasury, though, you thought, well, they should be paying something for this advantage, and the Secretary of the Treasury somehow managed to get a salary or to get a percentage, or, or somehow came out financially well off at the end of his term. Quay discovered that but Quay added to it. If he could see to it that a bank had a million dollars deposited there, Quay could go in two weeks later and say, I'd like to borrow a half million. And the bank would ask, what's your collateral? Quay said, what's my collateral? I put a million dollars in your bank. And if you don't like it, I can take it out and put that million dollars in somebody else's bank. And so he would be lent the uh, half million dollars, which he would invest in the stock market and make money. And then he would give the money back to the bank. The bank had the money to pay the state when the state wanted its money back. But what if Quay failed? You know, you invest money, sometimes you fail. He couldn't fail. He hadn't invested any money. It was all state money. So the bank had to make up from its half, whatever Quay lost, and the government still got its money back. And he saw to it thereafter that one of his henchmen would be Secretary of the Treasury. And the famous quote, I don't mind losing the governorship now and then, but I can never lose the Secretary of the Treasury. But that's the money side of the Quay organization. Now, as far as organization is concerned, Quay was always following this idea that we talked about earlier, silence. Organization meant that it was autocratic. He was at the top, and you didn't permit anybody to become a close rival. That could go a long way. It's not the only way of explaining why Pennsylvania has not had more presidential candidates. For many years, we were number two in number of electoral votes, but you didn't see presidential candidates. Nobody rose to that level. Quay saw to it. He had no ambition to be a president. He had no ambition to be a power in the sense that he promoted legislation, that you didn't see him as chairman of great committees. You didn't see him having his name attached to legislation. Quay was not a typical boss, a typical leader. He was a broker. Say a company in Michigan was interested in federal legislation that could benefit the business. They would ask their Michigan senators, see what you can do. It generally failed. If somebody in Ohio tried it, it failed, or any place else it failed. They just couldn't get enough votes together for what somebody wanted. But Quay could do that. 
politicians learned, or businesses learned, that if you wanted something done, you don't give it to the senators. You give your money to Quay. You had to pay the senators a lobbying fee. You have to pay Quay a fee. But he will get it done because he wants the votes of your two senators for other bills. That's the role he wanted to play. He did not serve in any prominent committee. The only two committees on which he ever served, public buildings and grounds was one, and the other one was territories. If we talk about buildings and grounds, you say that, that's a, a do-nothing job. No, it wasn't, not the Quay. Every state wanted one or more new post offices. You get a post office only by going through the buildings and grounds. And uh, that was part of the, the, the deals that were made for good legislation. If you wanted a post office, it's best to be uh, with Quay on other ideas that he has. So the uh, buildings and grounds was not a, a, a weak committee from the standpoint of Quay. Quay had enlisted in the Civil War very early. He was the colonel of the 132nd Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers. Very early, he suffered typhoid, and the doctors told him he had to go home. There's no way he could live in a camp and survive. While they were waiting for his discharge to come, the Army had moved to Fredericksburg. About the same time that he got the orders to go home, the soldiers were paid. The soldiers that knew he was going back to where there were post offices and things, he said, take my money and uh, mail my money uh, to my parents, to my brother, to whomever. And so he took their money separately and uh, where it was to be sent, sent back some back to Beaver, put it in his knapsack and was ready to leave when word came that the 134th was to go into the front line. And Quay said, I can't go home and leave my own soldiers go to the front line. I've got to get back into the service, although I'm a civilian right now. And he did get back into the service. And uh, they told him uh, he was foolish. He was gonna die going into the battle in his, his health uh, condition, Quay said. I would rather die and be foolish than live and be called a coward. So he did go in, and his unit, uh, the, that, that particular wave, made more inroads against the Confederates than any previous uh, attack. Quay, for his role, was given the Congressional Medal of Honor, as it was called then, just simply Congressional Medal today. So that established him with veterans. But he further established himself because he regained his health and uh, was called to go to Washington by uh, Governor uh, Curtin. Curtin wanted him to be something called a military state agent. Few states had military state agents, but it's, it's an idea that has not been fully explored. But a military state agent had to deal with troops that had originally been state militia units, sometimes just were mustered in as units in the federal service. Well, they had questions about their enlistment because it had been with their governors. And they asked questions of the governors. So as an intermediary, a military state agent in DC took those letters and supposedly answered them as best they could for the governor. Then Curtin called Quay back to Harrisburg and to take charge of all veterans mailing and sign my name to it. And Quay did an excellent job through the last two years of the war. And veterans knew that right off. And then as he was developing as a political leader, he realized he should use veterans as candidates. Any job that he could use a veteran as a candidate, he did. And he even used handicapped veterans Of course, he supported the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Back in those days, he was a newspaper editor. He had his own paper, and he supported this as a strong Republican. He identified with the Indians, no question. 
He was a humanitarian toward two groups primarily. One would be Civil War widows. They, they uh, received small amounts of money. He loved the Indians. Whether they were Florida Indians, with whom he made great contact, or what he called my Delawares in Pennsylvania. Supposedly his grandmother was an Indian and she was killed by the whites during the uh, wars between the Indians and the whites uh, back there. Uh, that gave Quay his first identification with Indians who actually made him an honorary chief. Uh, Quay had been elected to the Senate in 86. In 84, the Republicans had lost the presidency for the first time since the Civil War. And so when it came to the election of 1888, the Republicans wanted to make a strong comeback. And they selected Quay, a young man, had only been in the Senate two years as the Republican head of the nomination campaign. The Republicans believed they had lost in 84 because of fraud in New York City. Well, Quay accepted that, and the one thing he was going to correct was fraud in New York City. He decided to conduct a survey, survey every single house, every single property in New York City. He said he was developing a city directory so that people didn't catch on to what he was doing. So he hired individuals that toured the city, got the names of voters in every single house, and he had stacks of volumes. And he paid $100,000 on New York City. After he had this collection, he called the uh, Democrats in and said, see, this is what I observed of New York's voting rights. If anybody else votes, the jails aren't going to be big enough to hold them, because I know who can vote and who can't vote. Well, the Republicans did win the presidential election in 88. They did win by the margin of New York, and that's what it took. So Quay was a hero in that sense. The uh, candidate, of course, was Benjamin Harrison. Harrison was a very straight-laced Presbyterian who said that Providence had given him the victory. And Quay said, what a tenderfoot and uh, said that he didn't know the first thing about politics and how the election had really been won. Time passed, weeks that is, uh, and no appointments were being made. And of course, a new administration has to make new appointments. Uh, people are expecting appointments who campaigned hard for you. Quay went to see Harrison and told him, these are the people who will elect you. These are the people who are expecting jobs. And Harrison, a little man, stood to his full stature and said, God Almighty elected me. Quay picked up his coat and said, let's see if God can reelect you, and stormed out. That was the most vicious division within the Republican Party that they had experienced by far. Of course, Quay did see that Harrison was not reelected but he couldn't keep him from being renominated. The renomination issue of 92 uh, is just phenomenal in itself, how they tried to defeat him. But if you have a sitting president who wants a nomination, it's never been able to stop him. He, if he says so, he gets it. Sometimes the president says, I don't want to be renominated. But most of them say, uh, I have to have a second one to prove that my first one wasn't a failure. That accounts for uh, the Harrison-Quay relationship. But Quay made the comment at, at one point what politics was. Politics is the art of taking money from the few and votes from the many under the pretext of protecting the one from the other. First, he was up for re-election for a third time in uh, 98. But the Democrats wanted to defeat him. <laughs> they had tried hard. They had been unsuccessful. And in those days, the senators were uh, elected by the legislatures. They knew the legislature was going to elect Quay. 
So they thought, we can't beat him at the ballot box. The Democrats decided to try something other than the vote. They would beat Quay in the courts. A group sued Quay, said that he had misused state funds, which is a federal case. They charged him uh, with this crime. The idea being, if he's uh, charged as a criminal, you can't elect a criminal to the Senate. In Philadelphia, they were having a trial. Of course, Quay wanted a trial immediately. I, I, I'm not guilty. I didn't do these things. I can prove it. And so the trial is being held in Philadelphia, while in Harrisburg, the legislature has to select the senator. And they can't select a senator if he's possibly guilty. So they kept voting. The trial keeps going on. The Democrats had no new information against Quay, but they kept dragging witness after witness to say something, hoping that in the meantime, the legislature has to make a selection. So they have to select somebody other than Quay because he's still on trial. But they cast 79 votes in Harrisburg. I couldn't come up with a senator and finally adjourned. Well, in that case, the Democrats just dropped their case. As you know, T.R. had been in the war, the Spanish-American War. He had come home a hero. Uh, just at the time there was an election was up for governor in New York, Tom Platt was the same figure in New York that Quay was in Pennsylvania. They were friends. They ran the state the same way. Suddenly, the candidate was going to be Roosevelt. It didn't matter what the boss or anybody else said. The hero was there. And the uh, hero won the election and became governor. Governors were supposed to lay cornerstones, kiss babies, make speeches, and allow Platt to run the state. Theodore had ideas about every phase of government. There wasn't a phase of government that he wasn't going to change as governor. Platt was the most unhappy man, and he talked with his friends Puey about it. What do we do? He says, he says, I can't live with Roosevelt as governor. And so they decided between them, they would nominate Theodore for vice president, get him out of, of Platt's hair. Of course, Roosevelt heard about it. He didn't want to be vice president. He really wanted to be president. But he said, uh, the vice presidency is a graveyard. Nobody goes beyond the vice presidency. I do not want to be vice president. And so he demanded of Platt that he said, I want you to see to it that nobody from the New York delegation will nominate me for vice president. Platt said, sure, I can assure you of that. He assured him of that. Of course, he had somebody from Pennsylvania nominate him. And so Roosevelt was nominated for vice president. And when the campaign was held in uh, 1900 for the uh, presidency, it was held in Philadelphia. As the delegates from the West came to Philadelphia, Quay had his henchmen meet every train, told all the delegates, the Eastern establishment is trying to defeat your man Roosevelt. Of course, that welded the Westerners all behind Roosevelt for vice president. Of course, as a combination of the Western vote and the others, uh, Roosevelt was the vice presidential nominee with McKinley in 1900. Shortly after the uh, new election took office, McKinley was assassinated. Hanna was floored. He said, now look, the damn cowboy's president of the United States. And that's how Roosevelt and, and Quay, two of the opposite people, in the party got together. Quay was getting old at that point. His health was failing. He died in 1904. Toward the end of his stay in Washington, he was concerned about Indians. He had been the spokesman for the Indians. He had uh, not agreed that the Indians had gotten a fair shake out of Congress. And he told the president, he said, at your convenience, I would like to have my friends haul me around to your office so that I can talk to you about the Indians. And Roosevelt wrote back and said, you don't need to do that. I'll come and visit you after church on Sunday. Certainly, presidents do not visit in anybody's home. 
But he did go on Sunday and he visited with uh, Quay. And Quay asked him, would he take over as the protector of the Indians? Roosevelt said, I was so pleased to say yes. And that uh, he did. And uh, just how much he did is questionable. But uh, that was the last stand between the two. He never came to Beaver, even when Quay died. Every prominent senator was part of the delegation to the funeral. And the total Pennsylvania delegation was represented the house at the funeral. On the morning before Quay died, Roosevelt telegraphed Mrs. Quay, please let me know how the senator is. Of course, the evening they wrote back and said the senator had died. Kipling did most of his writing in India. A part of the story of Kipling that I think people don't, don't know very well. When he came, went home to England, he went by the Pacific, came across the U.S., and he came to Beaver. Supposedly, Kipling was told to get a story in America on the political boss. And so uh, Quay was the obvious one, and Kipling called on him, and Kipling saw the library. This is a part of Quay that uh, we haven't talked about at all, and probably should a little bit. Quay had a great library, one of the uh, finest libraries privately held. Kipling looked at one of the books, uh, one of the classics, and asked about it, and they started to talk about it. They talked all day about it. And according to lore, Kipling telegraphed the London paper, I don't have a story on the American boss, but if you want one on the American man of letters, I will file one. I never followed up on anything in England uh, about Kipling's relationship with Quay and what happened. As Kipling said, that uh, this was the American man of letters. You know, he was widely read. It was probably the most scholarly man ever in the United States Senate. I think the best evidence that Quay was well read was his interview with, with Kipling. But he, 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 he dealt directly with uh, outfits like Doubleday and Company and uh, Charles uh, Scribner. In fact, at one time I had hoped the Scribners was going to publish the book. In fact, Charles Scribner III did look at the manuscript. Apparently, the uh, Scribners had done a uh, a series of biographies that failed. And Scribner says, no more biographies. He wouldn't even look at it. His library, as far as I know, went to WNJ. I, I don't know who made that decision. That's what the grandson told me when I was there. Quay first got the idea of going to Florida about 19, or 1870. His son, Richard, was ill, and he thought that Richard needed the warm climate, he needed the waters of uh, Florida. So he started taking Richard to Florida. They ended up primarily in St. Lucie. He figured that uh, Florida was good for him too. In fact, after every election, he's off for Florida, and uh, he would spend the winter there. But it became difficult to run Pennsylvania from Florida. He had a railway built into St. Lucie. He had Republican politicians put on Pullman cars, brought down to Florida, and, and they would uh, work out the deals with Pennsylvania. What's going to happen in the legislature? They would decide uh, what laws were going to be passed, what weren't going to be passed, who was going to be nominated, who wasn't going to be nominated. The uh, Politicians would live in the Pullman cars while they were there. Then they would come back to Pennsylvania and act out really the uh, plan for Pennsylvania that the Quay machine had uh, developed in Florida. Well, while in Florida, he uh, developed an interest in the Indians of Florida. In fact, uh, he, he would put items in the federal budget. At one time, uh, uh, two senators from Florida looked at the federal budget and they saw an item for Florida they had no idea what it was. They hadn't even seen it. And they went to Quay and they asked him, 
And uh, he told them, this, this is for Indians. Whether it was for Indians or whether it was for the development of St. Lucie, nobody knows. This said that uh, uh, he, he was legislating for Florida as much as he was legislating for anybody else. And Pennsylvanians like to call him a third senator for Florida, that he was spending time there and uh, not doing the job that should be done here. And certainly he had a record for missing the Senate more often than most anybody else. One of Quay's friends, in going home one night uh, while drunk, crossing the Mickey's Rocks Bridge, fell into the river and drowned. And Quay wrote a note to the widow saying, Dear Lizzie, I'm sorry, uh, but I will take care of you. He saw to it that she was appointed postmistress at McKee's Rocks for the rest of her life. To tell how really far he went in taking care of people, you know, when he graduated from uh, Jefferson College, uh, he had classmates who were Southerners. It was a habit of the Southerners to send their kids north for a good education. And so uh, when they graduated, one of the boys from the South invited him to come down and spend some time in the plantation. And he did, and uh, he enjoyed the South. In fact, he learned about how cotton was handled. The families liked him that he met down there. And of course, when the Civil War came, the mansions were gone. The people lost all their money. They had kept aware of the fact that Quay had gone back north and had become a very highly successful politician. And one of the women wrote to him and said that she was destitute. Uh, she had nothing. And of course, she was a good song Democrat. He had to go through McKinley, who was president. He asked McKinley to appoint her postmistress in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. And uh, she was appointed postmistress, Mississippi. The Southern Republicans were furious because she's a Democrat. And they complained to McKinley. And McKinley decided maybe he better rescind the appointment. And Quay said to, said to McKinley, just remember one thing. Remember how many electoral votes Mississippi has and how many electoral votes Pennsylvania has. She kept her job. When the grandson called me and said that uh, uh, he had some papers that I regarded as a trip worth taking to be her, I could have them. And so I said, by all means. And I, I went down immediately. He was out at the curb and the, the books were out at the curb. He said, make of grandfather what you will. Grandfather is history, make of, make of him what you will. Make him devil or saint. Those were his exact words. Devil or saint, saint or sinner. This part of the legacy of Matthew Stanley Quay provides interesting fodder for debate to the point that the Beaver Area Heritage Foundation created a year-long exhibit in 2022, presenting both sides of the story and compelling visitors to make their own decision. What is not up for debate is that Matthew Stanley Quay's level of political influence, locally, regionally, and nationally, has not been seen since. 